Welcome to the ASW Archive. In February 2022, Amit Elazari discussed building better connections between institutions and the hacker community. Sometimes those connections come through policy, where it's important to understand each other's language and contexts. Sometimes it's through bug bounty programs. Amit also pointed out the deeper connections AppSec needs with academic institutions, from bringing together diverse domain experts to having industry work with researchers. She also shared ideas on what should be part of a security curriculum. Enjoy ASW 183 and stick around. New episodes are in the queue. This is a Security Weekly production for security professionals by security professionals. Please visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe to all the shows on our network. Dr. Amit Elazari is Director of Global Security Policy at Intel's Global Government Affairs Organization, a lecturer at UC Berkeley School of Information, and a member of the External Advisory Committee for the Center of Long-Term Cybersecurity at UC Berkeley. She holds a doctoral degree in Technology Law, that's a JSD, from UC Berkeley School of Law, and graduated summa cum laude of three prior degrees in law and business. Her work on security policy and technology law has been featured at top conferences such as RSA, Black Hat, and Usenix Security, published in leading academic journals, and featured in popular press, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, and Wall Street Journal. Hello, Amit. Thank you for joining us. Hi, good morning. Good morning. It's wonderful to have you here because we get to have a different sort of conversation, a conversation about policy, which is actually going to be interesting, I think. And a lot of the policy is topical because, as I was mentioning, Zero Trust, also recently coming out of the White House, and you've been yeah. involved in a lot of the policy area, but that also a lot of that policy area, I think, started with you building bridges between the hacker community and organizations, institutions, especially around bug bounty. So, so maybe we should start off with a little bit of just what brought you into both of this area of hacking hackers and the policy angle. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, I would like to, stay, to start all my Mondays like this. So uh, it's a pleasure <laughs> to be here. Happy Monday to all our viewers and our listeners. Um, you know, I, I've always been very passionate about the law. Uh, my background is technology law, but also technical engineering. I spent time in the Israeli military, um, among others. And I pursued a doctoral degree in, uh, in the law at UC Berkeley, and my work at Berkeley was really focused on interdisciplinary issues between technology and the law. And I became fascinated about how technology can kind of shape different regimes and domains in the policy spheres and vice versa. And as I worked on multiple areas in the area of intellectual property and privacy and security, mm -hmm. I learned a lot from my sister, Karen Elazari, who has a pretty, uh, uh, really interesting and fascinating TED talk about hackers as the immune system of the internet, about this concept of security researchers and ethical hackers, and how much that adversarial mindset and the work hackers are doing out there is important for organizations and for our security posture. And I was really focused about how we can shape the law and shape policies to build those bridges, right, between hackers and companies, between hackers and policymakers and hackers and governments, and find ways to address some of the challenges that we have in this space, specific, specifically in the area of anti-hacking laws. So I spent a lot of time with hackers. Some of that was a little bit of my own research uh, in the area of privacy and security that I got a number of bug bounties on and co-authored work that you can find online. But the other piece of it was focused on using what we call contractual means and specifically private ordering mechanisms to kind to, to try to create a standard in the area of bug bounties and vulnerability disclosure programs of one language, one set of terms, really focusing on expectations around legal considerations and building those bridges. So these issues are often termed like safe harbor, or uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Disclose.io, but the goal there was to cultivate this momentum of an understanding that in order to facilitate collaboration and transparency with security researchers and specifically with the hacker community, we need to also address some of the issues and concerns in the area of um, anti-hacking laws and how laws might potentially stifle research and come together um, to define approaches to cultivate more collaboration 
And there I work with a lot of companies and the platforms, and this is prior work before I joined Intel, but we are also supporters of this work at Intel. Uh, looking at adopting specific terms in bug bounties and vulnerability disclosure programs that focus on this concept of, of the safe harbor. So you can find a lot more information on that online. I co-founded Disclose.io, and there are many supporters in the community, people like uh, Casey Alice, people like Chloe Madeksky mm -hmm. and others that have kind of advanced that work. Um, and that has introduced me uh, to the fascinating world of security research uh, and the importance of cultivating policies that really focus on that collaboration. Operation. And, you know, in the last few years, I've been doing this work at Intel. I work on security policy across the board uh, with governments, with the ecosystem, with our partners, uh, with industry, with civil society partners to advance policies that support security, that en enhance trustworthiness, including in this important area of how can we better collaborate uh, with the community. Yeah, and Disclose.io especially is important because if you look back through history of, call it February 1986, so like I alluded to at the beginning, or February 1996 for that matter, uh, whether you're dial-up BBSs or just, you know, the, the text files of, of disclosures, there was a lot of in antagonism between the hacking community and organizations. And I think one of the things that you're also getting to with Disclose.io is just that distinction even between what's a bug bounty program and just what is vulnerability disclosure. And that type of language seems to be very important. So tell us a bit more about, you know, what does it take to have these types of shared language or teach or educate even policymakers when you're trying to build these bridges between a technical hacking community and organizations or government organizations that may still be technical but have different concerns, different thoughts, you know, different approaches of, of what they're considering is important to them. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's a great question, Mike. I think, you know, one of the things that I'm really passionate about, uh, especially in the policy space, that we have seen this tremendously growing interest in the area of product assurance, uh, and specifically security assurance and the importance of vulnerability disclosure program, that element of collaboration with the community. Among policymakers, we have seen tremendous uptake uh, in both the adoption of vulnerability disclosure programs, specifically also bug bounties, but I'm going to talk a little bit about mm -hmm. the distinction. Among governments around the world, we have seen a focus uh, in policies, in proposed regulations, even in the May 12 executive order, uh, you talked about zero trust. So another pillar of that executive order is, of course, that element of having those processes, the vulnerability disclosure program to collaborate with the community. And that is a focus uh, for federal, federal agencies as well. And part of that is, again, looking at the different tools that we have in our toolbox to advance security assurance. So at Intel, for example, uh, we have a number of tools in our toolbox to cultivate that momentum and that collaboration uh, with the community. We just launched Project Circle Breaker, which is a, a specific uh, bug bounty that is focusing on cultivating an even deeper engagement with the community, with an elite uh, group of 20 hackers. We are just, we launched just one element of this called, uh, um, you know, where we are focusing on the Tiger platform and we're looking into um, uh, kind of a time gapped event on the Tiger platform, inviting security researchers to look at issues in that platform in particular and inviting them to collaborate with our own engineer and learning from our engineers about that platform. Uh, but as you look kind of at the arsenal of toolbox, uh, we are seeing a lot of confusions between vulnerability disclosure programs and bug bound, bounties. Mm -hmm. these, these are distinct. They're also dis distinct when it comes to the terms, right? And uh, what we talked mm -hmm. about, which is kind of the guidelines of the program. But specifically, uh, you might want to consider to have those two different top toolbox in your arsenal as you look at product insurance investment. So in a bug bounty, of course, you are offering usually payments. Uh, you're offering incentives. Uh, to test specific uh, systems uh, in the scope, and you're cultivating that researcher, that research collaboration through that incentive mechanisms, through paying bounties, paying monetary, uh, providing those monetary investments. Now, you can do private bug bounties, right? Time bound bug bounties. You can have a public bug bounty running in the background. Again, as I mentioned, we have a number of tools. Uh, we have the public bug bounty at Intel that has garnered really great results. We just launched our product security assurance report. You can look at the numbers of CVEs that we found for our collaboration with the bug bounty. But in addition to that, we have a vulnerability disclosure program. And again, we are deepening our engagement with the community through private bug bounties or time-gapped events with multipliers, and this is Project Circuit Baker that we just launched. 
A vulnerability disclosure program is a little bit different. A vulnerability disclosure program is basically focused on setting expectations pre- very, very clearly to the outside world. If you researchers, if you external entities are finding issues, this is how you can report them to our organization very clearly what is kind of the scope, the the method of communication, what are the expectations? And we have seen safe harbors or language, uh, more broadly language kind of clarifying, we're trying to address some of the legal concerns in both vulnerability disclosure programs and bug bounties, and there could be a bit different. So again, I think more broadly, as we look at this landscape, one of the things that we are recognizing is policymakers are focusing on this area. Tremendous investment, uh, you know, not just from organizations, but also from the governments of the world and policymakers on deepening that engagement with the community. We have just seen, you know, the recent uh, uh, cybersecurity review uh, board that is part of the executive order got launched by CISA. And we've seen how CISA is cultivating this momentum of engagement with the of collaboration with the community. And I think we will continue to see it. Uh, and as we are looking at those different landscapes, I think one of the learnings from Disclose.io and the work that I've done in the past in this area of addressing or mitigating legal concerns is we should be very active in trying to find new ways to foster that for, uh, transparency, collaboration, listening to researchers and their kind of concerns and really deepening that investment. And this is part of what we're doing right now at Intel with Project Circuit Breaker. Yeah, I know. It, now I know Project Circuit Breaker has just launched, and I have a couple of questions though that I want to come back to that. But you also mentioned the, um, you know, the 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 CISA's uh, new uh, safety, uh, cyber safety review board that that spun up, and, and you mentioned just then, you know, in pre- what are things that we like to see? We want to see new approaches. We want to see better transparency, and hopefully, and I don't think we'll see this coming out of the review board because the the initial members is it's, it's a great cast of, of industry veterans. We don't, I think, need to see go patch your stuff. That's pretty well known, um, but it's also pretty difficult. So, what are you know? So, what are some ways that you would imagine a, a good policy aspects would be, or good ways to form policy so that it is something that is not just the FTC is going to come after you if you didn't patch on a thirty day SLA or, or something like that. Yeah, so I mean, the, the policy world is complex, and we were always going to have mm-hmm. regulatory approaches and arm regulatory approaches, and you know, different policies trying to leverage different mechanisms in order to you know foster security. I think what we're seeing now as part of this momentum is a great focus on collaboration. It's a great focus mm-hmm. on bringing multiple perspectives into the table. A tremendous focus on public-private partnership, on operational co- collaboration, and you see that with JCDC. You see this with this. Uh, review board and the like. Uh, as we are, you know, looking into policy in the area of security, there are a few kind of underlying principles that we always focus on. Uh, we talked already about the importance of bringing all this perspective together. This is the concept of the public-private uh, partnership, and this is a lot of our focus. You know, we we are not just in the area of policy making and working with the governments of the world to foster, uh, you know, security policies. Also, in the area of working together in the technical standard bodies and mm-hmm. in other um, kind of efforts, R&D efforts and frameworks definitions, are, for example, by NIST, we always try to collaborate with the ecosystem and bring the perspective. And I think that element of collaboration is really important. Security is complex. Security is com- dynamic. Innovation is changing all the time. And addressing the landscape of attacks requires that, you know, all ends on board approach. And this is not just where the security ecosystem and the research ecosystem is coming together, but again, all these different stakeholders. So I think that kind of focus area will continue. Uh, I think it's, you know, very welcome. We, we continue to see this focus on this, including with the recent review board. And I think the other issue is we need to be mindful as we are looking at this landscape that it's possible that one technology that we have uh, in mind right now or one type of threat vector or threat uh, kind of landscape uh, risk we are seeing right now, which is very prominent, uh, would change with time. You know, it's very, security is very evolving. So as we are looking at policies, we are trying to take what we, what we call Um, in my field, a technology neutral, design neutral approach, which is making sure that it's not the the approaches to policy are not just risk based. So we can accommodate a very uh, broad spectrum of risks and innovations, but also we don't bake into policies, potentially a solution, a technology solution that might be outdated with time. So just one example is to make this very uh, kind of clear to our, as a case study to our listeners, uh, think about passwords, right? 
passwords uh, is a concept that might become with time obsolete, right? We, today, we are thinking about a much broader set of authentication means and kind of a zero user touch uh, experience when it comes to authentication. Uh, so one of the most important elements is as we're thinking about policies is how do we not kind of create an overly uh, kind of prescriptive approach to policy and keep that flexibility? Um, you know, one of the things that I'm very passionate about is the fact that we need to take an holistic posture toward uh, posture toward security. So as we look at Intel about security, it's not just the innovations that we drive through our architectures and our solutions to address uh, this the evolving landscape through technology solutions like confidential compute, like solutions in the architecture to enable unique authentication, zero trust onboarding, uh, or to allow uh, a better threat mitigation uh, landscape through threat detection. It's not just what you have in the architecture. It's also about your assurance practices. And this is where we are seeing now, especially with the Biden administration executive order, but not just that across the world globally, a focus on the importance of assurance practices like software development lifecycle, like having those means, right, to invest in security researcher research, not just internally for your red team and your offensive uh, security research uh, groups internally, but also through that work with the community to find issues, to invest in external research, to invest also in cultivating research through academic collaboration, and then address the issues right through quantum vulnerability disclosure uh, processes that allow you to make sure that you ship those updates to the end users in a way that increases adoption. So that focus, that holistic kind of lens towards security, I think, mm -hmm. which is co comprehensive of both on device and both processes, I think, I think it's very promising. And this is the direction that we are seeing, right, in proposed policies. It is, and it's definitely a, a direction of um changing culture rather than that you just say that NIST SP863, for example, doesn't say, we, well, we need to go from eight passwords to 12 password or to 12 character limit to a 16 character limit. They're actually taking a very different approach about, as you were saying, what is authentication? What are the, the primitives for building a good one? I also want to, since it's Year of the Tiger you're, and you're talking about uh, Project Circuit Breaker and Tiger Lake, I, I want to poke at that a little bit just because I think that's a really good topical example that you set up here because I believe in Intel, you know, has a little bit of an extra challenge in getting a researcher community or hacking community around hardware because there are extra barriers to entry. You don't, you can't just spin up a web browser, go to a URL and start hacking hardware. You need access to hardware. You need uh, access to developers for that matter to understand some of the nuances, some of the design decisions within the, the hardware itself. So tell us a bit more about, you know, how you're setting up that dialogue, that collaboration with researchers, as well as I, I think you hinted or started to about some of the academic side of that as well, so that we actually yeah. have, you know, education of researchers coming in in the future. You know, that's a great question, Mike. And I'm so proud, you know, about th this sp specific uh, project is just so uh, exciting. So, I think, you know, you have touched upon something really important. If you looked at traditionally bug bounties, they've grown, uh, you know, decades ago in web application, right, in different environments. And in embedded, if you look at silicon and hardware issues, one of our focus areas has been always how can we cultivate that the research momentum, the collaboration uh, with researchers in an area, in an area that is a little bit harder, right, uh, to explore. And we recognize that an investment in order to cultivate that momentum requires a lot of different tools, right? So I talked already about, you know, the public bug bounty that we had since 2018 and, you know, the results that we are seeing from this um, bug bounty where we have, you know, very uh, considerable amount of our issues found uh, and reported for a bug bounty. It's 86% and you can check that on our product assurance report that we just uh, released as part of our transparency. But it's not just about the bug bounty uh, and it's not just about the work we're doing with academia through our Intel labs, our grants, uh, through participating in conferences and events and doing awards, awards like we last uh, we launched last year specifically for academic hardware security papers. Uh, it's also about thinking bigger. Uh, what can we what else can we do to deepen that engagement? 
And how can we address some of the challenges specifically in the area of hardware, right? Where it's about getting those devices to the hand of researchers. It's about creating opportunities to maybe sit down with our own engineers and train uh, those that community of elite hackers and researchers about our platforms, kind of really being a hands-on, in a hands uh, hands-on collaborative dialogue with them. And this is really the focus of Project Circuit Breaker. So it's very exciting. It's not just going to be about this first event that is focused on Tiger Lake and the Tiger platform, which is a pretty you know, recent platform. One of the reasons that we are excited about this is because this is a pretty new uh, line of products. And we are very interested in getting kind of the insights of the community specifically for that, uh, for that area and for that um, CPU. It is about continuing and evolving that toolbox and listening uh, listening to the researchers and hearing from them what else do they need from Intel. So I'm inviting all our audience uh, to check that out. It is public. Uh, it's called Project Circuit Baker and you can find it online. In this particular area, we are inviting 20 researchers. This is already ongoing. Uh, and these 20 researchers, elite hackers, have received systems. They received our core i7 processors and they're testing it. And part of what we are offering uh, with this program are multipliers on our bounties. And this is running in addition to our public bounty. And what we are planning is, again, additional events, addition targeted uh, kind of time box. Uh, uh, challenges where we are looking to really collaborate with the community. And a big pillar of it is, you know, basically um, engaging with more and more and more researchers, creating a broader and diverse community of researchers specifically for embedded. Uh, so this is a little bit about that, that project, um, you know, please hack us, of course, according to the <laughs> program, check it out online. Uh, it is uh, invite, so you can find all the information there. And this will be rolling out until May. So there's going to be a lot of opportunities to collaborate with us through that program. But we also have our public bug, bug bounty, which is running in the background. So and one of the things that we try to do on this show is just provide educational resources, references to CTFs, known vulnerable applications, things like that. But one of the things that we quite honestly, struggle to find are good resources that point to curriculum from universities. Uh, so I'm curious, I, you know, I almost lost track of all of your degrees as I was introducing you reading your bio. Um, you clearly quite familiar with academia. What are some things that you would look to or that you would love to see more of within, you know, what's a security curriculum so that, you know, new grads come out with a better fundamental, a better foundation of security rather than having to start from scratch and diving into to bug bounty from, um, you know, from almost uh, zero knowledge? You know, uh, that's a great question, Mike. Um, it is, for me, kind of connected it to connecting this, your question to kind of what we talked about throughout this whole episode, which is the topic of transparency. And I think it's really important to put resource out there. So a lot of what we do is being very transparent about our processes, but we also work with the ecosystem to make you know, standards available, working together to cultivate from frameworks, share from our practices. And this is where we have, for example, the bug bounty community of interest. And we can go online and we are participating in that and find different information about bug bounties. And we already talked about Disclose.io. But to your question uh, with respect to curriculums, I mean, one of the areas that I've learned a lot uh, specifically from is the concept of having interdisciplinary research and basically sitting in the room, right, with different, with students and from, uh, with uh, kind of uh, having that a mutual approach towards learning where you have both people are come, that are coming from the law, from, from policy, from political science, from engineers, everybody sitting together and learning about the topic. This has been a tremendous focus in security. I've seen, I think we have seen more recognition that we need that interdisciplinary view in order to address the challenges, in order to simply understand the attacks, right? And what mm -hmm. risk we have mm -hmm. out there. We need that more diverse lens. And I'm really hopeful, um, and you know, this is part of you know what I, I'm involved in, right, at UC Berkeley uh, in the School of Information. I'm really hopeful that we will continue to see that focus, right, in curriculum. So more policy, political science, uh, legal-oriented kind of approaches towards uh, security being taught in computer science uh, curriculum, 
more generally, even more security is a focus in computer science and engineering curriculums. We have started to see that already. I think that will be con continue to be a focus, and that's important. Uh, and also think about, you know, making resource available. Uh, you know, today we have security is very focused on that. I think we have a lot of uh, researchers, leaders, acad academic kind of pioneers, companies, we all come coming together to put resources uh, out there. But this has also been a focus of policymakers as we think about the workforce of the future. Uh, and that is in particular very exciting. And um, I think it's just kind of, you know, having that understanding of both the need for interdisciplinary lens as it comes to security, but also the needs for continuous investments and work for, and, and resource. Yeah. And I think I, I, will, I, I hope this is a good assertion that I think at the macro scale, you're describing intergovernment, you know, inter organization or coordination amongst institutions at the policy level. That's where policy happens at a, at a very macro scale. But I think what a lot of you're describing too, just the interdisciplinary approach, we're, we're more than just technical engineering approaches to development or security is also applicable at the, the micro scale, meaning how our AppSec teams and DevOps teams collaborating, working together, how Absolutely. they translate this is what our policy needs to look like as we get to design and implementation. Absolutely, Mike. I mean, this is the best part of my work. Um, I love speaking with our technical experts, with our engineers, with our security leadership, um, and learning from them about our practices. Uh, I think in that area where we're all coming together and really in the kind of almost like the the joint area in the Venn diagram where all the perspectives are being combined, this is where the magic happens. This is where the innovation happens, right? So um, it is micro, it's, it, uh, micro it's, it's macro, but it's also a continuous area of investment where we're, we're going to need to put a lot of more resources in, in order to make sure that we continue to cultivate right, mm -hmm. that uh, diverse, holistic mindset towards security. And this is the focus that we're seeing in policies. And um, it's very exciting. And, you know, maybe this is probably my biggest call to action uh, as we all work uh, and consider the next generation of policies and regulatory tools in the area of security is that focus on not just risk-based approaches and technology neutrality, but the continued look at security as a holistic issue, right? So fostering those investments in, area of, in areas of academic collaboration, of research, uh, having, you know, very diverse works, work workforce, uh, but also having a diverse toolkit, right, to advance security. And this is where you're seeing the security assurance practices, uh, you know, cultivating that open ecosystem and the work on software security together with the on-device, you know, mm -hmm. security uh, hardened technologies that are coming from the silicon, from the foundations up. I mean, I want to uh, back up a tiny bit um, and this is this method as an education for our listeners, so I don't mean this is a gotcha against you, so um, um, please don't take it that way. Um, you mentioned something around, uh, you know, you want you want everyone to hack you, but only where you guys want to be hacked. Um, and, and from my experience, the, the hackers and elite hackers and, and a lot of people in the industry, um, they don't take a, a request like that very seriously. So and the reason I'm asking this to you is I think with, you know, um, sort of, you know, leading policy and be being fairly, um, um, uh, uh, how will I say, exposed to high level talks and understanding what happens at a larger organization like Intel, would you maybe want to talk for a few minutes about why you ask someone to only, you know, focus their security lasers to use that phrase at the places where you want them to versus, you know, what's going on behind the chair? What Any thoughts or comments around that for our listeners? Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to kind of recognize, I talked about an arsenal of tools. So mm -hmm. uh, we have that arsenal of tools. We have a public bug bounty, which has a much broader scope, right, than this specific project, Project Circuit Breaker, that we're just launching, uh, which is open in the background. Uh, and in that, pop, you're, you know, our hackers, our community, our researchers are still very much invited to participate in the public bug bounty, which has a broader scope. And we also have a vulnerability disclosure program. So people are invited to report to us issues that they find, right, uh, more broadly, right, even if they don't want to participate in a bug bounty. Uh, so we have that public bug bounty. Uh, it's running since uh, in a public form since 2018. 
uh, and we cultivate research through that. We have the vulnerability disclosure program, so already two tools. And this is, of course, in addition to our own internal offensive research efforts and our own investment in product security assurance, and in our and in in addition to our investment in collaborating with academia, right, through our Intel Labs programs, for our, for example, paper awards and uh, the work we're doing there. On top of that, we recognize that we wanted to continue and deepen our engagement. And so we create another incentive-based program that that is Project Secret Baker. So I think it's important to draw the distinction and say, we are not just looking uh, at collaborating with the community through Project Circuit Breaker. We are very excited to kind of deepen the engagement there. And that's why we are offering, you know, multipliers on the bug bounties. We are offering specifically, you know, this focus on, on, on the Tiger platform. We are offering hands-on collaboration with our engineers. But we have many, many other tools where we are saying, you know, hack us, report it. You have the public bug bounty program. You have the vulnerability disclosure program if you don't want to particip participate uh, in the bug bounty. And we are welcoming all the collaborations. In fact, we have multiple ways to kind of collaborate and kind of create those frameworks that extend beyond just the research community. We are also working very closely with academia. So maybe that's the key uh, distinction that I would draw. And my message, you know, is that we are looking for that collaboration across the board, what we recognize with Project Circle Baker is that we need to be doing potentially, you know, we want to deepen that en engagement in a specific area and we want to hear from the community what works. Right. And as we are going through Project Circuit Breaker and we have this new exciting focus on the Tiger platform and working with these 20 researchers, we're probably going to hear more. And then we're going to be exploring as part of, you know, everyone's evolving journey in security. What else can we do in the community? And, you know, I think that underlying uh, kind of um, understanding that this the security not only security is a journey but your collaborations with the ecosystem is also a journey is part of the areas that i'm mostly passionate about i learned a lot from the community and that has been you know the focus of my prior legal work but here you know what we are seeing is this journey towards transparency and collaboration would require very different tools that are working together all the time. And that's kind of the relationship between project circle breakers and more generally private bug bounties, right? To get together with public bug bounties, together with vulnerability disclosure programs. Cool. And I think that there's an aspect there too, that it sounds like setting up the diff the distinction between bug bounty program where we will reward you within this particular scope and having a disclosure program that's just we will acknowledge that you that there are things that fall out of scope that that may be found that i suppose is also what comes back to the the idea of disclose io and is it going to be an antagonistic relationship whether it's just more of you owe me a bounty versus you don't owe me getting sued. So, you know, maybe along the lines of John's questions, what are some of the ways to or, or resources to start to build up those programs? Because I, I I don't think it's it's very easy to to turn on a Monday and say we've got vulnerability disclosure, we've got a bug bounty program, uh, come hack us. So, how yeah. can people, you know, what are, what are some ways to get started perhaps along that journey? Yeah. And I think you, Mike, you touched on a really important point, which is, again, as we look at the concept of uh, private bug bounties and public bug bounties and vulnerability disclosure programs as tools in the toolbox, uh, there is a distinction to be drawn. And not every organization is ready, right, for a bug bounty or a private bug bounty or, uh, you know, uh, there could be different considerations, but the fundamental understanding of, of having a vulnerability disclosure program, having that very clear means to collaborate with the ecosystem, clarify that you welcome reports from the community, and this is how you can reach us, uh, and here are the expectations. I think that's where we're seeing a lot of focus from policymakers. It's under it's kind of an underlying capability that we're seeing, not just in IoT security regulations and many areas, and now we have seen, of course, federal agencies, the focus there uh, with CISA bots, it, it started already in 2020, but of course, this is a pillar of the, the recent um, uh, executive order. Uh, there are a lot of resources out there. Um, you know, I think it's important to recognize that setting up a vulnerability disclosure program, or if the organization is ready, in addition, a bug bounty program or something else, uh, you should consider how what approach makes sense to your organization. Above all, uh, there is this understanding that obviously, you know, getting the reports is only a piece of the puzzle. Then you have the entire quantum vulnerability disclosure process. And specifically, by the way, in hardware, it can get uh, pretty complex. We called it multi 
multi-party uh, uh, quantum vulnerability disclosure. And there is a, there are resources uh, resource that are available uh, to the community. First, we have international standards, ISO IC uh, 30311, 29047, uh, KD Missouri is an Art Armenian uh, regional mm -hmm. co editors And these are these international standards are really you know, recognized as um, being very, very important to advance our joint understanding of what it means to do vulnerability disclosure, both in terms of the setup of the reporting, right, and the communications, but both in terms of the handling process. So once you get that report, what do you do with it internally? How do you handle the vulnerability in a way that creates, uh, you know, studies the issue, looks at creating a potential mitigation, validates the mitigation across different uh, environments, and then releases uh, release the mitigation to the public in a coordinated fashion. We call that the handling process. And those two international standards are, are very, um, you know, well regarded. Uh, but on top of that, we have NIST frameworks uh, that has that have been released. We have the first.org frameworks in this area. They are resourced by CISA. They are resourced by NTIA. They are, you know, reports by ENISA. Uh, so if you look it up, there, there are a lot of different options and kind of available resource for you to look at it. And it's, it, it is important to recognize that uh, even though we have those frameworks like Disclose.io, uh, the DOJ framework for consideration around how you want to draft a vulnerability disclosure programs, you have all these different best practices. In the end, you have to tailor it to what works to your, for your organization. And specifically uh, for the community, it's very important uh, to try to use very clear language, set the expectations. We know this area of expectations around communication is one of the most important areas when we think about collaboration collaboration with the community and fostering transparency. Uh, in the area of uh, the legal issues, as I mentioned, you know, this is a complicated area and, uh, you know, obviously organizations should look at uh, their own legal advice and what works. But what we try to do with Disclose.io is to create that mutual understanding, that type of language. Uh, as part of CISA BOT 2001, they actually released a template for federal agencies and uh, organizations can look at that. As I mentioned, you do have Disclose.io. So there are resources out there and there what you, you can kind of specifically look at. Uh, there is a boilerplate, what we call safe harbor. Um, that is the concept of how you can address potential or mitigate some of the legal concerns associated with reporting by creating either a partial consensus or full consensus and kind of setting the expectation of, you know, if the researcher follows the policy, what are kind of the considerations around authorization, which is this main pillar of anti-hacking law. So and you've given us a lot of resources, and it's going to take definitely more than uh, 30 minutes to go through through all of them. We'll also be curious about the, the what the uh, results of the Project Circuit Breaker look like and, and what you learned from that. So we'll absolutely have to have you uh, come back. Uh, but for now, I absolutely want to say thank you for joining us this time. This was uh, really educational. Thank you, Amit. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. Uh, we will be back uh, to talk on, on you know, the results from Project Circuit Breaker, especially if you will have us. Uh, Katie Noble, great friend. Or she runs our P-Cert uh, Bug Bounty. I think she would be a wonderful person to talk about it. Uh, but and really enjoyed this conversation this morning and morning. And thanks for having me.